For a minute, I thought Sheldon was going to preach my sermon for me. (laughs) Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. Standing here this morning, there are many thoughts swirling through my head. But there is one that I shared at 8.15. that still echoes in my head right now. Remember your first impressions. Remember your first impressions. You know, two years ago, still two years ago, upon receiving the news of this new appointment, to come to this great gathering of brothers and sisters in the faith. I remember looking at the website and reading the mission of this congregation. Act so that God's love is felt by all. And just gazing out here in the sanctuary, I'm, I'm blessed to see some of those faces. Some of those familiar faces. Faces that were in what we can call today Brady Bunch boxes <laughs> that we've become so familiar with over these last three years. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, Zoom. (laughs) Amen. And I remember one particular occasion where the then Chair of Staff Parish Relations, through her spirit and through her presence, was more concerned about me coming here than anything else. I thank you, Michelle. These are first impressions of the ways in which you, Grace, United Methodist Church, have acted so that God's love is indeed felt by all. There are many other first impressions that I have been so grateful to experience. One in particular wasn't one that I experienced, but it was one that my wife encountered. Because believe it or not, two years ago, not only were we moving from one appointment, that being in Catonsville, from Emmanuel United Methodist Church, a church that I served for four years as a quarter-time pastor, but there was nothing quarter about my time (laughs) pastoring Emmanuel United Methodist Church. For many days, I would travel from D.C. to the Hellthorpe train station, and on 695, I would always have to stop by Emmanuel United Methodist Church just to make sure that the lights were on when they needed to be on, both in the parking lot and to make sure that the lights were off when they needed to be off in that church. First impressions, Adrian, when we moved into our new house and settled in Owings Mills, had a visit by a stranger. That stranger is the now chair of staff parish relations. (laughs) She came unannounced. I didn't know how she got the address until later finding out that a very dear friend who after asking me what's my home address, provided it to Becky for race. Becky, I know you're not here, but you're written in the sermon anyway. (laughs) 
Becky came by dropping off a cake, leaving that with us. First impressions and action so that God's love is indeed felt. These are but two examples standing here this morning that are a reflection of many actions that this church stands behind. This is the mark of what this church is truly about. And I've just been privileged enough to see it firsthand. You know, there's something about actions that speak so much louder than our simple words that we may form to make statements. For it is good to know, standing here, that this church represents actions so that God's love is truly felt. Those words have been reflected in the many conversations, both publicly and privately, of the love that I've received. And I thank each and every one of you. I think I might have said this to a few of you, and you probably looked at me in wonder. What exactly is LeBron talking about today? You all are written here in this sermon because your actions reflect the love of God so that people like this simple kid from Cleveland, let me say that again, this simple kid from Cleveland have experienced, and I thank you. I thank you for allowing me to spend time with you I thank you for the opportunity, even though some people have resorted to calling me names in my departure. The one that resonates is short timer. <laughs> but there's nothing short about our time together here in this season. Again, I remember coming here in the midst of COVID a very difficult time for all of us. I remember, I remember Jack. Didn't mean to call you out in front of everybody, but I'm sure you can appreciate this. I remember Jack coming by the church and ushering me out on a few rides where we went to visit some of our homebound members. And I remember one particular occasion, very early in my short time of my appointment here, where we visited a member of this church in the very twilight of her season And I remember Jack giving me all of the details, prepping me up, propping me up to go into this room and to sit with this person. And I remember a light that beamed from her. I held her hand. I didn't know her from Adam. And yet Jack briefed me on everything I needed to know. We sat together. I prayed for her. Her daughter in the room thanked me. Again, I didn't know her from Adam. That was just simply where I was called to go. I didn't do anything special, friends. Nothing special but the thing the very thing that I was called to do. On the evening of January 23rd, 2023, I received a call 
from our district superintendent, informing me that the bishop and the bishop's cabinet, following a time of prayerful reflection and discernment, had decided to assign me to the appointment of lead pastor for a new charge here in this Baltimore metropolitan district. I remember the call from Dr. Duckett quite vividly because the call came as I was turning down the road that leads to my home. This, of course, was after a long day at church which followed a much longer Sunday afternoon, an afternoon which included a church council meeting and perhaps even an impromptu meeting thereafter. Monday was just an ordinary day in the life of a clergy person. I did my usual ritual of waking up in the morning on that Monday, going to the gym, ordering the food that would reach many of our young Baltimore public school children. I might have even let George know that I might be a little late coming in and let Tim, the man who makes everything happen around here, both seen and unseen, that food would be coming. And then I arrived at church. It was just an ordinary Monday. But driving home that evening, receiving that call as I turned into my driving parking lot was nothing more than ordinary. I remember ending that call with Dr. Duckett and I sat in my vehicle for probably a lot longer than I normally do when I get home because to be honest, when I get home, I am wiped out. I am drowned in exhaustion. But I went in the house and I told Adrian, Adrian, I just received some news that's going to change us for a season. And I don't really know what to, to do. You know, Dr. Duckett and I had this conversation and the one thing she told me is that I needed to provide an answer to her within a reasonable amount of time because time is of the essence when these appointments happen. And the one thing I remember when I said yes to this call was the understanding that we serve as clergy in itineracy. It's a big word, but really what it means, we go where the bishop sends us. We go where the bishop sends us. Perhaps there is an exception to that, and that exception is simply if I found it that this missional call was in conflict to the call that I believe God has placed on my life. So I went in the house, I told my wife, I said, babe, the DS called and now I have to make a decision after I've actually gotten comfortable My butt grooves were actually in that chair that I occupy in that study. <laughs> and that's not an easy thing for me to allow. But yet and still, I could not make this decision faithfully and fully until I allowed God's Spirit to speak to me. There were no words uttered, there was no revelation offered, there was no burning bush. Although I wish there would have been, it would have made things a whole lot easier, especially on a day like this. I was perplexed, I was not sure what I would say, but I knew I had to give it the time that it deserved and the attention that it required because it was a serious call. No different than the call that came in the summer months of 2000.
21. When I discern that, yes, God was calling me here for a time such as this, I didn't know what to expect. I certainly didn't know how did you, any of you would receive me. But I trusted that God, if God is calling me here, then God would equip me with everything that I need to be effective. Not for my sake, but for the sake of God's kingdom here on this earth. And so just as I discerned then, I discerned in January. Will I go? Adrian will probably tell you this, but I couldn't even sit still that evening because I was so overwhelmed that I had to leave. Now get this, I had just gotten home. I was tired. I was worn out. But something inside me caused me to go down back to this area and then further towards the city. I drove down to 22nd and St. Luke's, St. Paul. St. Luke's is where I used to drive. <laughs> and I sat in the parking lot of the Baltimore Lab School. And I just sat there, contemplating exactly what would I let the DS no. Still didn't have an answer, friends. So I drove back home. Again, I was tired, Diane. I was worn out. I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning. I might have even hit the snooze button far too many times for my wife to appreciate. She'll tell you that as well. I hit the snooze quite often. And then I woke up and I went down to my basement and I tarried a little bit more, Sheldon. Until that very loud voice that whispers said, go. Later that day, I informed the DS that I graciously appreciate even the consideration. A kid like me from Cleveland Biz, can you imagine that? Would go to a place that so many has told me, you've landed on the mothership. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. But this kid that majored in history and is undergraduate, this kid who has studied at Wesley Theological Seminary, this kid that understands the importance and significance of things, came to realize that for so many people, this thing that our bishop has done has historical implications and I just stand on the precipice of it. But friends, I tell you this morning, I am nobody. I'm just a kid from Cleveland who's crazy enough to trust in an amazing God who has brought this 48 years of living to a time and a place such as this church to see actions, actions, to affirm to me that God's love is felt by everyone. You know, a friend of mine, this older gentleman that I meet occasionally at my gym, Brick Bodies, His name is Joe. Sometimes we sit in the locker room and Joe finds a way of making sure that everyone knows that he's there. 
he will greet you even if you don't want to be greeted. <laughs> Joe and I have developed this kindred relationship with one another. And Joe shared with me something a few weeks ago that has resonated with me. It's a familiar statement. I don't think he intended to take credit for it. But I just think for a minute he wanted me to know this in this time and in this season. Joe told me that in life there are things that occur for a particular reason. Then there are other things that occur in a particular season. And then there are those particular things that happen in our lives that will have an impact on us and others for a lifetime. I felt like I heard this before somewhere. And then I encountered this storyteller, writer and radio personality, Annette Petrick, who offers a similar if not identical reflection. People come into your life for a reason, a season, and even a lifetime. When someone is in your life for a reason, it is usually to meet a need that you have expressed or just felt. They have come to assist you through a hard time to provide you with guidance and support to aid you physically, emotionally, perhaps even spiritually. And then, suddenly, that person disappears from your life. Your need has been met, and their work is done. Some people come into your life for a season because as you turn, as your turn has come to share or grow, or give back. They bring you an experience of peace or simply just make you laugh. They give you great joy. Believe it because it's real, but it's only for a season. Lifetime relationships though, they teach you lifetime lessons things you must build upon to have a solid emotional foundation. Your job is to simply accept the lessons, love the person, and put what you have learned to use in all of your other relationships. I invite you to think about the people in your lives that have touched you over the years, whether they were there for a reason, or maybe even a season, or even a lifetime. Accept them and treasure them for however long they were meant to be part of your life. And when they are gone, be thankful for the gifts that you have received from them when they were here for a reason, a season, and a lifetime. In our Hebrew text this morning and the gospel reading, we encounter two unique call stories. In Genesis, the Lord calls Abram from his familiar surroundings, his community and his country the reason for God's calling was to raise up a great nation from this individual from Haran, blessing both Abraham as well as those who bless him. And through this man, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That means each and every one of us sitting here in this sanctuary today, glory be to God. The season of Abram's life seemed rather peculiar for God to call him and to leave his homeland, his community, his people. 
For Abram was 75 years young when he departed Haran. Perhaps Abram considered whether his health, his mobility, perhaps even his energy was unsustainable to go where God would leave him. But still Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, taking his wife, his nephew, and all of his possessions that they had accumulated and set out to the land of Canaan. Scripture tells us that Abram's journey was not an easy one. And here today, we should never underestimate the gravity of Abram's decision. For in it, he had to leave the comforts of life and the community that by all accounts was familiar in exchange of going into a land that was unfamiliar for him, his family, and all that he had accumulated. And still, Abram goes. Trusting in the promise and the providence of the Lord and not in his own plans or his family ties. And in this, we see that the call of Abram by the Lord affirms that the Lord is the one who will fulfill all that the Lord declares to those who trust in God. The Lord promised Abram a great nation. Abram didn't deserve this. And all he had to do was to simply trust and faithfully obey this summons from the Lord. A quote by Connie Ten Boom states this. Never be afraid to trust the unknown future that is known by God. Never trust an unknown future that is known fully and completely by God. Consider the occasion, the reason God may be calling you in this season of your life. Perhaps there is something unknown, not yet revealed, that God, with God's long eyes, a preacher once told me that, long eyes, that sees into the future, a future that is unknown to us, but is known fully by the all-wise knowing God. Not yet revealed to us, but with God's long eyes is already known and already declared for a lifetime of blessings both to you and to those who, through your faithful obedience to God's calling, may benefit. Now, none of us could imagine exactly what Jesus saw in Matthew, this tax collector, as he sat there at his tax collector's booth. We have an idea of the perception of Matthew by those living in his community. Indeed, this man, Matthew, was not respected. He was part of an unpopular group, as Sheldon intimated before us while he was reading the scripture, who carried out the agenda of Rome, garnishing what little the people had to benefit Rome. Jesus, however, was very much aware of this reality, and yet he still calls Matthew. Get that. This unpopular man, this despised man, robbing from his own people to benefit the one who oppressed them all. Jesus says to him, follow me. Matthew, for his part, despite being preoccupied with the affairs of his work, which brought to him an element of profit and comfort in exchange of being, in a real sense, a social outcast of his day. 
the socially despised man saw something deeper in this call by Jesus. Maybe he found himself at the crossroads of his personality, of his responsibilities, his professional obligations, and a deeper purpose in his life that this Nazarene man saw in him and was calling him into. We know the reason for his calling, for the Lord was gathering his chosen people. And the season was in the fullness of time when the incarnate Lord enters into the world to reveal the message of salvation and redemptive love that would carry with it a promise, a promise for a lifetime to those who answers the call. Go from your country, follow me. Two unique calls requiring action from those the Lord calls. Today, God is calling us all. Just as the message on this church's website declares, to act so that God's love is truly felt by all. God is calling. How will you, how will all of us, each of us, every one of us, answer that call? Amen.